you. Yeah, it's the first time I've been called a patriot. I'm, I'm technically Canadian. So uh, <laughs> I don't know what I'm patriot for. But uh, so as the final speaker of the event and the person between you and the cocktails and as a speaker in good standing with the uh, amalgamated speakers of England, Scotland and Wales, I am required to make a joke about being the person between you and the free drinks. This is that joke. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk today about uh, how we know when we're winning and what we can do to win more in the fight for a free, fair, and open internet. And I want to start with a little bit of history and contemporary theory about network neutrality, an issue that's been in the news a lot lately. You've probably noticed it. Um, network neutrality is kind of a weird success story in terms of, of policy entrepreneurship because when Tim Wu, uh, another Canadian who masquerades as an American, we went to elementary school together, when he published this paper in 2003 coining the term network neutrality, no one dreamed that the term would ever find an audience outside this small circle of telecoms competition wonks. Not just telecoms wonks, not just competition wonks, but people who cared about telecoms competition. This super narrow Venn diagram. It's not even like an overlap, it's a sphincter of people who care about these issues. But instead, network neutrality, it turned into like SOPA 2.0, the, the second great internet uprising. And that's despite the fact that we never changed the name. I mean, John Oliver, who paid uh, a lot of attention to it and, and raised attention for it, he thought that we should rebrand net neutrality, which was too boring a name, as cable company fuckery, as a way of getting people to care about it. Um, and after that segment aired, uh, the internet averted, right? People started calling their lawmakers. They marched in the street. The, the, it was unthinkable when you think about this, this obscure issue of network management suddenly getting warm bodies uh, out of their seats and in the street. And it worked. In February 2015, the FCC voted to classify ISPs under Title II, and that bound them to follow the net neutrality rules that had already been in effect for most of the internet era. But in the future, as we move to fiber and as cable takes over more of the infrastructure, and they ordered states to uh, end the practice of banning cities from creating their own municipal networks, uh, even in places where there was no other network option, even in places where no one wanted to provide uh, service. There were cities that were banned from providing service themselves. Uh, but that was eventually overturned after a lawsuit from the telecom sector challenging the FCC's authority to do that. So that was 2015. And then in 2016, Donald Trump was elected and he, he appointed this guy, Ajit Pai, who's a former Verizon executive, to be the new FCC chair. And uh, he had vowed to end net neutrality. And in order to do so, uh, he had to hold these inquiries, these, these uh, notices of proposed rulemaking, notices of inquiry that are part of the way the administrative branch of government operates. Uh, and then he had to throw away everything that people told him. So he had to throw away millions of comments supporting network neutrality. He had to pretend that millions of obvious fake comments uh, opposing network neutrality from dead people or people who came forward to say that uh, they had never uh, uh, opposed network neutrality or the one million people who sent comments opposing network neutrality from Pornhub.com addresses. He had to pretend that all of those were real. And he also had to throw away all of the expert commentary, including letters from uh, the people who had created TCPIP, who'd founded the first ISPs, who were arguably the country's greatest telecoms experts. He had to throw all that stuff away. Uh, and he also had to throw away uh, uh, some other really gold standard evidence about the effect of network neutrality on, on network infrastructure. So one of his arguments was that when you limit uh, the ability of telcos to uh, charge differentially to services, that you limit their incentive to invest. And he cited as evidence for this that the telcos had told him this. But he ignored something the telcos had said uh, in a different context. When the telcos had been making official uh, disclosures to their investors under the Title, 50, uh, Title II rule that came into effect after 2015, they had said network neutrality has no impact on our investment. It doesn't matter whether there's a neutrality rule or not. We're going to make the same uh, investments. Now, what's interesting about those two different sets of disclosures, the disclosures that the executives made to him at the FCC's hearings and the disclosures that they made to their shareholders, is that under Sarbanes-Oxley, if you lie in your disclosures to your shareholders, you, Mr. Senior Executive in the C-suite, you personally are criminally liable and can go to jail. 
Whereas if you lie to the FCC, all that happens is the FCC tells you that they're very disappointed. And so as between these two sets of comments, the one saying that network neutrality was a drag on investment, which had no consequences for lying, and the comments that said, we're actually investing just as we always did, and there's no problems with investment raised by uh, net neutrality, which were made under penalty of prison, he decided that the ones made under penalty of prison could be safely discarded and he should only be listening to the ones made with no penalties for lying. Um, and Pi made it clear that he not only wanted to um, get rid of net neutrality, he also wanted to salt the earth and make sure that net neutrality never flowered again, that nobody ever really, nobody came forward later and said, I miss my net neutrality or I see net neutrality flourishing somewhere else, I'd like it here. So he passed a rule that said that states could not uh, make their own net neutrality orders. So this is a really interesting reversal. It's a pretty common thing you see in policy circles. Uh, when the net neutrality opponents were not in control, they said that the states uh, had the right to make their own telecoms policy, to ban cities from creating uh, their own networks, to, from creating network neutrality zones. But once the net neutrality opponents were in national control, they said the states had no right to set uh, statewide telecoms policy that 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 exceeded the authority and that this was a this was federal jurisdiction. I'm kind of neutral on the question. I'm no uh, commerce clause scholar here, but I do point out that if Ajit Pai survives the court challenges that are pending and manages to make rules that say that states are not allowed to overrule the FCC then the next commissioner we get who's in favor of net neutrality will make net neutrality rules that the states can't override. Uh, you, can't, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So Pi's order, it passed on December 14th, and it doesn't go into effect in, for a while because it's a dog's breakfast of sort of handwritten annotations by lobbyists inserted at the last minute, and there's a cleanup phase before it actually becomes the law of the land. But more importantly, there's a bunch of courtroom and legal challenges to, uh, to this rule. One is that um, the uh, uh, administrative agencies are not allowed to just make policy because they like the policy. They, they're supposed to be expert agencies and proceed on the, on the basis of evidence. And as you heard, Ajit Pai ignored most of the evidence. And so there, is, uh, there are lawsuits uh, on behalf of several states saying that he ignored the evidence. Uh, there's also an, uh, uh, an attempt to recall his rule through something called congressional review. There are 50 senators now who support it. If one senator flips, then, um, then it will move to the House. It's tough to see whether it could ever pass the House, at least as it's presently constituted. But on the other hand, network neutrality enjoys crazily high recognition and approval, 87% according to uh, a recent re a reliable poll of Americans know that network neutrality is a thing, which is itself remarkable, and support it. And so there are a lot of people fighting contested elections, primaries and elections against uh, people from the uh, other party who, uh, for whom uh, opposing network neutrality is not uh, going to be a donation getter or a vote getter, and who are going to be asked through this congressional review process to go on the record and say yay or nay for network neutrality, not to just be in the room when network neutrality was killed, but to have taken an affirmative step to either kill it or rescue it. And I think that the game theory there is kind of interesting and hard to, to see how it would go. But, and though it's a long shot, we live in an age of weird long shots, right? I mean, you know, would Trump sign it? Well, you know, on the one hand, he's kind of mercurial and hard to predict. On the other hand, he's kind of anti-establishment, except when he isn't. But on the other, other hand, Trump supporters, at least the ones bright enough to know how Trump took office, Trump supporters understand that uh, the, the kind of um, uh, non-traditional uh, insurgent media that they used to organize themselves could never have existed. I mean, Breitbart would have never been a force if they'd had to bid against Fox News when they were starting out for carriage on the internet. And so to the extent that he understands what side of the, of the toast is, is buttered for him, he may in fact not veto the rule. But who knows? And that brings me to another question. Are we winning the fight for network neutrality or are we losing it? Who knows? It's the wrong sort of question to ask because political change is a process and not a product. It's a process governed by four forces. Uh, they were laid out by Larry Lessig in a, in a book called uh, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace in 1999. Um, he says that our, our uh, code or that our world is regulated by these four forces. Code, that's what's technologically possible. You, you can't do things that are technologically impossible. Uh, law, 
what's legal and what isn't legal. Legal things are more likely to happen. Uh, uh, markets, things that are profitable, happen more often than things that aren't profitable. And norms, what's socially acceptable. Now, you may have noticed that these things all work together, right? Stuff that's uh, uh, normatively okay, stuff that everyone thinks is all right, is much less likely to be made illegal than stuff that, every, than, that everyone thinks is bad. I, this is why we say hard cases make bad law. Um, and so uh, let's look at where network neutrality stands in this kind of Lysigian framework. On the code side, well, back to our old pal Tim Wu. Uh, Tim Wu, the guy who coined the term network neutrality, when he was working for the um, state attorney general in New York, he built a tool to measure network activity, an open source tool that uh, subscribers of Time Warner could install that measured network performance, ne measured network discrimination and network speed and throughput. And he used those measurements to go back and accuse the carriers of, wrong of wrongdoing. He, he called them to heal by being able to describe in a factual way using data what they were doing, as opposed to kind of these nebulous accusations of screwing around with our network management, he was actually able to show this is where the traffic drops off, this is where you have your choke points and so on. You can't fight about things that you can't accurately describe and we have more code than ever. Now, law, uh, well, we got Title II in 2015, this network neutrality rule. Uh, and um, the uh, and so that was good for us, but now we have this legal challenge to it. Uh, and then markets, well, telcos are the original concentrated market sector. The Tim Wu, in one of his great papers on uh, competition, uh, copyrights competition policy, he notes that uh, the older a sector is, the more likely it is to become concentrated and cooperative instead of combative. Right Over time, you have winner-take-all returns to scale, the number of players in an industry drops to a very small number, and the likelihood that anyone working at any firm has previously worked at one of the other firms goes up and up. Uh, and so, you know, this is often a problem when we staff our expert agencies. It's not just that we can't find someone to work at the FCC who wasn't a Verizon exec. We can't find someone to work at the FCC who isn't a Verizon exec who used to be a Comcast exec, right? Because the sectors become very concentrated, very incestuous. They literally intermarry. Uh, you know, you have family dynasties, people whose father and sons worked or mother and daughter worked in the same industry. And at that point, they stop going at each other's throats and they start cooperating and going to DC and asking for special favors. And they're often up against insurgent new industries like the internet industry as it was, say, 15 years ago, when you had lots of tiny companies that were attracting lots of investment, yes, but they hated each other's guts. And so they were all after each other. And so it was much easier for uh, firms to, uh, to come after them. So um, that, was, that was great news, but now the telecom sector, its concentration is leaking into the internet sector. Uh, phone companies are starting to buy online companies. Uh, so you know, in the last round of network neutrality fights, uh, Tumblr, which was then part of Yahoo, was a, uh, a huge force in support of network neutrality. Now Tumblr is part of Verizon and uh, it has been a lot more lackluster in its support of network neutrality. Uh, so markets aren't necessarily on our side, but uh, the norms sure are, right? Coming out against network neutrality makes you look like a colossal asshole. And so uh, people are showing up and marching in the streets and they care about this in ways that uh, we've never heard of. Millions of Americans care about telecoms policy. Millions of Americans are able to utter the phrase network neutrality without being put in a, a bored coma by just the idea of caring about network management. So are we winning or losing on network policy? Well, the answer is both. You know, last year we leveraged uh, the, uh, the norms to win a legal battle, and this year the legal side got a huge pushback from the market side, government got bought out by big telecoms, and this year we've got bigger norms again. So winning and losing, it's the wrong side sort of the question, because the right kind of the question is, how do we win more than we are right now and lose less than we are right now? This is a, a security problem, right? Uh, when you are red teaming your adversary, you look for their weak points and you try and find your strong points and use your strong points to attract their weaknesses. And our strength right now, it's norms. Uh, network neutrality, for all the talking points about how network neutrality is regulating the internet, it's not regulating the internet. I mean, telecoms are regulation. You know, you can't build a phone company without getting governments to give you rights of way through a city. If, if you wanted to go Galt 
and build the ultimate market-based phone company without any government assistance, you would have to walk around Los Angeles and buy the right to every sidewalk, every right of way. You'd have to buy the long haul routes between Los Angeles and New York. And as many people have discovered when they're trying to buy that many parcels of land, the value of the last piece of land that you need, as soon as someone figures out that they hold the place where you're going to drive your golden spike, that value goes up to nearly infinity. If you've ever looked at a map of Disney World, you'll see that there's a tiny dot in the middle of Disney World that doesn't belong to Disney. It's exactly how that happened, right? Someone got wind of which shell companies were actually working for Walt Disney, and the middle of his parcel of land twice the size of Manhattan was a piece of land that he absolutely could not afford to buy. It currently has a very nice hotel in it. If you want to bargain the next time you go to Disney World, you can stay in that hotel. So telecoms is regulation. Um, we're not arguing about whether or not the government should regulate telecoms. We're arguing about which regulations are appropriate for telecoms. We're asking whether or not telecoms, having been given a trillion dollar subsidy from the public in the forms of rights of way, should give the public the, the stuff that they ask for when they click on links, or whether they should give them the stuff that um, the public, uh, that, that their shareholders would prefer them to give, right? Should customers of phone companies be required through regulation to arrange their affairs to the benefit of phone company shareholders or to their own benefit? That's really the regulatory question that we're asking. So are we gonna win this time now that we have this normative victory? Well, it's the wrong question because although it would rock to kick back Ajit Pai in a court of law and it would certainly rally the troops to the fight when there's a turnover in Congress or a change in the composition of the administrative agency, agencies, if we lost, it would also galvanize tons of people, as we saw when Ajit Pai killed network neutrality in December. So when network neutrality rules are in place, you get businesses that start that want network neutrality. And when network neutrality rules are nuked, those businesses come to the fore and they help you with it. So you get market forces when the, when the law is there, you lose the market force when the law is taken away. Um, and the bad news is that, um, that uh, there is no one way to know that you've won or lost. I mean, think about 1982. In 1982, the FCC broke apart AT&T, uh, but the carriers came roaring back. Uh, of course they did. Uh, the carriers did not, you know, those executives at those phone companies, they didn't uh, uh, drop dead or take up Zen Buddhism and move to an ashram. They didn't lose, they just had a setback. And like Voldemort, they worked at the margins, slowly building up their strength, merging all of their, their uh, baby bells into one giant AT&T. So, um, the industry, uh, so, so that industry is now united and is fighting against network neutrality. And we have in the, uh, in the online industry en uh, entities that are fighting back, but they're concentrating too. And eventually some of them figure out that they would rather uh, work together to, uh, to fight the new guys who are showing up and that through a non-neutral internet, they can pay for premium carriage that their new competitors can't pay for and that that's actually to their advantage. So we, we can't necessarily rely on them or not rely on them. You know, in the, in the 2015 fight over Article 2, or Title 2 rather, uh, the, um, uh, we had a huge boost from Netflix. Uh, Netflix then in their shareholder disclosures, remember the disclosures that you can go to jail for lying about, said very frankly, and I, I think with admirable frankness, that although they really support network neutrality in 2016, it's no longer an existential threat to them, right? They've eventually, they've hit that point where they can buy their way to the front of the line and where it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if that was what they had to do because at least they would be able to stop the next Netflix from Netflixing them. So it's just as it's useless to ask whether we're winning or losing, it's useless to ask whether companies are on our side or uh, not on our side. Companies aren't on our side, companies are on companies' side. So the right question to ask is, how can we improve our situation and under what circumstances will companies come to our assistance in doing that? So I want to apply that to some other issues here. Uh, let's talk about back doors, keys under doormats. This is the thing that EFF made its bones fighting over in 1992. In 1992, the NSA banned civilian access to strong cryptography. Uh, they argued that uh, DES 50 was sufficient for all civilian uses. Uh, all of the arguments that we mustered against it that were financial or normative or technical, they were thrown away. So we said, you know, DES 50 is crackable. 
and they said, well, we hire all the PhD mathematicians that graduate from the Ivies and the Big Ten. Uh, who are you guys to tell us that DES 50 is crackable? The NSA says it's not. And then we tried some technical proof. John Gilmore, who founded the first ISP and was one of the early employees at, at Sun and helped write GCC. Uh, John Gilmore built a purpose-built DES cracker, quarter million dollar machine that could work through all of DES's uh, key space in two and a half hours. He said, that's what we're defending all of American finance with. They threw us out. Uh, we made, uh, we made um, economic arguments. We said, you know, the banks can't afford to not have good crypto. They threw us out. Uh, but then we made a legal argument. We represented this guy named uh, Daniel Bernstein. You probably know him. He's a famous cryptographer. Back then he was a UC Berkeley grad student. And we said that uh, Dan Bernstein wants to publish strong crypto on Usenet. Right, the message boards that were uh, what, we ha what passed for the internet before the web came along. And uh, we said that a prohibition, a state prohibition on publishing that source code is a limit on his First Amendment right to expressive speech. That code is a form of expressive speech. It is the means by which coders express themselves to one another. And here in the Ninth Circuit, we prevailed. We prevailed in the appellate division of the Ninth Circuit. And because we had a legal victory, even though norms couldn't save us, even though business markets couldn't save us, even though um, uh, technology couldn't save us, law was able to save us. And that's been the law of the land since. So uh, the, law, the law is very US specific, right? It relies on the First Amendment to, to, as its bulwark. And other countries don't have First Amendments. But what other countries have is a planet on which the United States exists. So whenever someone moots banning crypto in the other countries, the Australian uh, 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 security minister recently went to a Five Eyes meeting in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, and he said that, the f that um, we should ban access to working crypto by uh, anyone except for governments. What everyone else immediately said is, well, the bad guys are just going to bring their code in from America. Uh, your ban doesn't stop bad guys from using it. It just stops good guys from defending themselves against bad guys with it. Hilariously, Malcolm Turnbull, the prime minister of Australia, then followed up by saying, I don't know, what the, I don't know much about the law of mathematics, but I assure you that in Australia, the law of Australia is the law of Australia. In other words, if the law books say pi equals three, then in Australia, pi is equal to three. Good luck with that. Um, so the destiny of, of uh, backdoors in the U.S. is very important. The U.S. right now is a bulwark against backdoors everywhere else in the world. And if the U.S. falls, the rest of the world falls. And so that's a big deal because we get these cases like the San Bernardino shooters and the FBI arguing that we should uh, get rid of strong crypto because bad guys can use it. Uh, as we say, hard cases make bad laws. So let's look at where we stand on backdoors. And, uh, and talk about Larry's, Larry Lessig's four factors here. Let's talk about norms, first of all. How do we feel about backdoors in the world? Well, things like the Vault 7 breach are certainly making the case against backdoors, right? The idea that we can have uh, states that have secrets that they can use to break into our secure systems and that those secrets won't be independently discovered was totally discredited by the Vault 7 leak. Uh, the Vault 7 leak gave academics, including a team from Stanford, the ability to evaluate whether or not zero days that are hoarded by governments, which are really just backdoors by another name, whether those uh, zero days are independently rediscovered. And what they found is that the rate of independent rediscovery is about 20% per year. So every s secret the state holds is independently rediscovered uh, over, the ca over a maximum of about five years. And so that would mean that you would expect a back door to fall in a maximum of five years. And then there was, you know, the ransomware epidemic. That also made the case that weakening the security of everyday systems is a really bad idea. It, it put the fear of God into people who had never really thought much about uh, crypto and security before. Um, but, uh, and there's also this increased appreciation that although law enforcement has uh, chicken littled a lot about how criminals are going dark and they're not going to be able to spy on people with impunity, that metadata is in fact an incredibly powerful tool for doing police work and crime fighting and that cops are actually able to do things that they were never able to do before and the fact that they can't go back in time and play back every conversation that we've all had uh, is not a thing that they've lost, it's a thing that they've never had and that uh, we can still uh, fight uh, terrorism and crime even if we can't backdoor our crypto. But at the same time, we have darknet hysteria, we have the cr use of cryptocurrency and ransomware, we have real world kidnappings that are being paid for with, with crypto. So it's kind of a mixed bag in norms. 
Now, in markets, there's some pretty good news, right? Uh, full disk encryption is now standard, and companies wouldn't be using full disk encryption if they didn't think customers wanted full disk encryption. We have end-to-end -end, uh, encryption in messaging apps like WhatsApp and now in, in Facebook Messenger. But the bad news is that um, AT&T made tens of millions of dollars backdooring its own phone system and then selling access to governments. And the zero-day trade is alive and well, and there are lots of states where there's a thriving market for insecure, deliberately insecure technology. You know, Ethiopia is a good example. It's a, an effectively a failed state with no inbuilt technological capacity that is nevertheless a really sophisticated surveillance state because they've been able to buy in surveillance equipment from the Western world. At EFF, we represent a client who is uh, in the court records as Mr. Kadani, who is an, an exiled Ethiopian journalist who lives in Washington, D.C. The Ethiopian government used a zero they bought from a, a Western supplier to break into his Skype to mine his contact list and then to round up all of the people he worked with in Ethiopia who were opposition journalists and put them in jail and torture them. And so uh, while, we, while we, on the one hand, have markets that are in favor of more secure equipment, there's certainly a lot of money to be made in keeping things insecure at the moment. And then on the law side, well, the First Amendment's still the First Amendment. Bernstein is still Bernstein. We still have the idea that code is a form of expressive speech, but hard cases make bad law. The United Kingdom passed a law that allowed them to do hackback and to hoard zero days and to do lots of other bad things. That law has just been substantially invalidated by the uh, uh, UK appeals court, but it was invalidated on the grounds that it, it violates European law, which won't be effective in the UK in another 10 or 12 months. So again, kind of a mixed bag. Uh, and you have lawmakers mood and, and law enforcement mooting weird ideas like responsible encryption, by which they mean crypto that works perfectly when a bad guy is trying to break it, but fails catastrophically when a good guy needs to break it. And we, math doesn't know whether you're a good guy or a bad guy. Um, so that's, that's where we stand on backdoors. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the war on general purpose computing, by, by which I mean uh, digital rights management or DRM. Um, so DRM, it's a stupid idea, right? You can't hide secrets and equipment that you give to your adversary and then hope that they don't find those secrets, right? Like even really good bank safes are kept in bank vaults, not in bank robbers' living rooms. Because once you say, well, we've hidden the secret that stops you from uh, blowing up the consensus hallucination that there's such a thing as streaming and allowing you to actually save those uh, Netflix videos that you're only supposed to be streaming and not, and not saving to disk, but um, by once we give everybody who wants a Netflix account a Netflix account and with it an app that has the keys necessary to blow up that consensus hallucination, then we give the keys to like bored grad students who have an electron tunneling microscope and a bunch of undergrads and nothing to do this weekend. And they find the keys, right? The security model where you hide keys in equipment you give to your adversary, the technical name for it is wishful thinking, right? <laughs> The way you keep keys secret is by not telling people you don't want to know the keys what the keys are. Anything else doesn't work. But even though it's stupid, it's not harmless. This very fragility of DRM has required the erection of, a, of an infrastructure to support it, but not a technical infrastructure, a legal infrastructure. Under Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, a 1998 law passed under Bill Clinton, uh, it is a felony punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine to weaken or bypass DRM. And that includes vulnerability reporting, where that vulnerability reporting touches on things that might allow an adversary to weaken or bypass DRM. And so DMCA 1201 has come to be a way for companies to prescribe how you use your own property to ensure that you use it to their maximum profitability. If you make a phone and your business model depends on you having all the apps be sold through your app store, you just design it so that buying apps from a different app store requires bypassing DRM. And now buying apps from a different app store is a felony. And so this has, be an, this has been an enormous moral hazard. We're seeing DRM in connected sex toys. We're seeing DRM in pacemakers. We're seeing DRM in seismic dampers that keep skyscrapers from falling down. And wherever you see DRM, what you should really think about is an unauditable attack surface for which there is a business model, right? Where the more you put of it in your product, the more you can prescribe how your competitors can interoperate with your product and how your customers must use your, prop your product. Conceptually, there is no difference between locking a phone to use one app store and locking a toaster to use authorized bread, 
right? One vision system later, and that toaster will not toast someone's bagel unless you uh, unless the manufacturer has blessed it. And you can make all the same arguments, right? Kitchen fires happen. Poor food sanitation kills. Uh, we can't warranty this your your toaster unless we can know what goes in it. And it sounds like a joke, but there was an Internet of Things. Uh, uh, toaster oven, well, they're a convection oven company that went into business last year that only cooked DRM equipped meals, MREs that had a little tag on them that they could read before they cooked them. And they made every argument you've ever heard for DRM in mobile devices or other devices. So if something is your property, you get to decide how to use it. That's practically the definition of property. In fact, it is the definition of property taught in most property law 101 classes. Blackwell on property, 17th century theorist who said, property is that which man enjoys sole and despotic dominion over to the exclusion of every other person in the universe, right? If it's your property, you get to decide whose software runs on it, how it's configured, what it does when it gets a remote instruction that doesn't go with, that doesn't accord with your own interests. If a manufacturer can reach up out of your product and go upside your head for failing to arrange your affairs to their shareholders' benefit, then that device is not your property. You are a tenant of that property. And, you know, one of the places where it's being widely used is John Deere tractors, where the, a farmer who wants to fix their own tractor or even just get the telemetry that the, factor, the tractor gathers about their fields as its torque sensors and humidity sensors parse out the data from the wheels as it plows the back 40, those farmers are not allowed to do it. And John Deere co told the copyright office that you don't own your tractor. Right, that you are a lessee of the tractor because you only license the software in the tractor and without the software, the tractor is just a big expensive hunk of metal. That's like being a literal non-metaphorical tenant farmer, except instead of being a tenant farmer of the land, you're a tenant farmer of the agricultural equipment needed to work the land. And a bonus side effect of this from the perspective of a firm is they get to decide who gets to uh, publicly uh, uh, reveal bad news that hurts their share price. Right? Their defects and their products become proprietary information that you are not allowed to disclose. Now, some of you work in bug bounty programs. Some of you contribute to bug bounty programs. Ask yourself, why is there a bug, bug bounty program? I mean, in the best examples, it's because companies really want to know whether or not uh, there are bugs in their products. But if you listen to the pitch that bug bounty companies make to, to the companies they're pitching, the, the companies that manage bug bounties, they say, if you don't have a bug bounty, randos are going to zero dump your zero days on Twitter, right? You need to entice people to come in through the front door or they're going to throw bricks through your goddamn window, right? Well, what if you can just put people in jail for disclosing defects about your products? How many firms, if made custodian over bad news about their products, would use that custodianship wisely? And if they would use it wisely today, how many of them would continue using it wisely after a change of upper management in a year or two? Right? We can't afford to not have a system in which people are allowed to tell true facts about defects in systems that they rely on. So where do we stand on DRM? Well, on the code side, it's great news because DRM is a fool's errand and that is not going to change. Don't hide secrets and equipment you give to your adversaries. On the markets, bad news. It is very profitable to make DRM right now. In fact, it's probably the only way to be profitable. If you're one of the modern Internet of Things companies, you are marketing hardware at a 2% margin that falls dramatically to zero or negative if you're successful and cloned and sold on Alibaba. And so the only way to make money is through the ecosystem, locking down and controlling parts, uh, consumables, service, and gathering data. So Internet of Things devices tend to be as surveillant as possible. They want to gather as much data as they can because that is the thing that might get the firm purchased. These firms have six months to a year of runway. If they breach all of that data in six months to a year and they haven't found another uh, a, a, quarter, uh, a, a, a suitor to buy them out, then uh, they're bankrupt and it doesn't matter to them. If they have sold out in the six months to a year, it's someone else's problem. So there's zero impetus to have more than the minimum viable security to keep that product from actually bursting into flame before you run out of runway. Anything else is just gold plating and it's a dollar spent that you couldn't use to keep the doors open while you were looking for someone to buy out your Internet of Things startup. So there's a lot of DRM out there. DRM has become a fixture in automotive sector. Uh, you want you to fix a GM uh, car, you got to spend between fifty and $70,000 for the authorized tool because the telemetry coming off the engine has been DRM'd. Uh, and it's got huge costs to SMEs in the world of repair. So local repair is an intrinsically local industry. You don't send your car to China to get it fixed. It's an onshore industry. And repairing a ton of e-waste creates uh, 200 jobs per kiloton. Uh, 
uh, recycling a ton of e-waste creates 15 jobs per kiloton. But it, manufacturers don't want independent repair, and manufacturers want to be able to declare an arbitrary end of life for products and say that this product is no longer available for sale and will no longer be serviced. And so they have increasingly used DRM to lock down the servicing of their products so that adding a new uh, part and then activating it requires knowing an activation code. This is usually pitched as an anti-counterfeiting measure, but it has this wonderful side effect for them of allowing them to lock down the service market. Now, on the other hand, breaking DRM is also profitable. Some academics from the University of Glasgow uh, did a, 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 a nice study where they scraped data from Amazon of recent model uh, DVD players, which are the ultimate in commodity hardware. That's 2% margin land. And they compared the clearing price of DVD players, like for like, same number of reviews, same average rating, except w the uh, control group was a normal DVD that honored uh, all the anti-piracy stuff that the DVD CCA mandates. And the uh, experimental group were ones that illegally disabled some of that anti-piracy stuff, the, the DRM stuff. What they found is that disabling DRM in a way that allows you to just to do lawful things, to buy out of region disks and do other things that are not piracy, except that they require uh, defeating DRM, that raises the clearing cost of those devices by 50%. So compare the margin, 2% to 50%, non-commodity hardware. So there's a potential market constituency for breaking DRM. Once people start making bank breaking DRM, they will fight to make it legal to break DRM. So how about on the norm side? Well people are starting to wake up to DRM. Jailbreaking is a huge issue in more and more communities. Gamers want to jailbreak, phone owners want to jailbreak, uh, printer owners really want to jailbreak. Uh, and uh, it, people are, are starting to understand that when your device says that it won't let you do something, that it's not because it doesn't have the technical capacity, it's because it's decided that you don't deserve to do it. And that's starting to offend people down to their marrow. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, states, generally like DRM because DRM is very surveillant. Once you have code that can run without the, users, uh, without the user knowing about it or the user being able to terminate it, then any kind of lawful interception backdoor that runs in that kind of ring minus one zone, that zone where even if you're root, the computer will lie to you about whether or not the process is running, that's great news for lawful interception tools. And so it's kind of hard to get states to step up to the, to the plate and, uh, and, and pass laws legalizing something when it when they depend on it being illegal but on the law side it's actually not terrible uh, we uh, at the Electronic Frontier Foundation we sued the US government in summer of 2015 we represented two uh, clients one is uh, Bunny Wang who's a legendary hacker he broke the Xbox uh, he uh, he um, is an MIT uh, ENG PhD. He's a Media Lab affiliate. Uh, he makes a device that defeats uh, uh, HD, HDCP, and he's suing for the right to do that in order to allow people to make fair uses. And we're also representing an eminent security researcher named Matthew Green at Johns Hopkins University. Matt, you probably know his work. He has an NSF grant and a book deal to, uh, to do research into a whole raft of devices that have DRM in them. Uh, including uh, voting machines, uh, the black boxes that do high-speed um, uh, uh, transaction processing at financial institutions, and uh, also uh, industrial control systems. And we're suing on both of their behalf to invalidate Section 1201 and make it legal for anyone to do these things, to show that these violate the First Amendment. So where do you fit in here? Well, you have real power, right? Your employer dropped some non-trivial sum of money to send you here and put you up in a hotel, and that's not because they're big-hearted slobs. It's because they need you. Security experts are a non-fungible, highly scarce resource that are essential to the successful operation of every enterprise. In a world where millions of people are looking for jobs, you are the people for whom the jobs look. You are the people with inboxes full of solicitations from recruiters. So you have power and you need to flex it because your job, the thing you do, it's under attack. The DMCA and other laws like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act have become the rug that inconvenient truths that you surface can be swept underneath on penalty of law. In a world in which security is inevitably an afterthought and billions are at risk, your ability to speak the truth about the dumb mistakes companies make is under sustained and ruthless assault. You security experts are the elite, like it or not, and your employers need you. They sent you here maybe as a little bonus to continue your training like a parent sending a beloved pampered child to an expensive summer camp. 
And I want you to go home from camp with a homemade ear piercing, a comprehensive vo vocabulary of shocking swear words, and a word perfect knowledge of every song the Ramones ever sang. <laughs> I don't care how bad Hollywood or anyone else wants DRM to be a thing. It's not a thing, but that doesn't make it harmless. This is Jennifer. She works at the post box where I get my mail. I hope you folks all get your mail somewhere other than your house. Uh, and she has three kids, uh, and she loves no Netflix, and she has photosensitive epilepsy. And the worst seizure of seizures of her life were while watching a movie on Netflix where her photosensitive epilepsy was triggered, and she had five consecutive seizures that landed her in the hospital. There are not, not enough human video watching hours remaining in our species future history to watch every video online and tag it and add assistive tracks to it and shift its gamma for people with color blindness and mark out all of the strobe effects that might trigger seizures. But we can do all of these things with video if we can use code on them, if we're allowed to run the code. If it's not a penalty, uh, felony punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine by getting around DRM except that the W3C just standardized DRM for streaming video and refused our proposal that members of the W3C would have to promise not to invoke the DMCA when people were doing accessibility work or reporting security defects or doing otherwise lawful activities. Now, you and I, we are only temporarily able-bodied. If you live long enough, you will be a person with a disability. The principle that technology should be configurable to suit the needs of disabled people is not an act of charity the able-bodied do for the disabled. When you secure that principle, you protect your own future self. In just the same way that installing an unauditable attack surface in the browsers used by three billion people is bad news for you, it's also bad news for everybody else. So what can you do? Once again, your employers need you. You signed up to make computers safe for people, not to help the cause of making people subservient to computers. If your boss wants you to design DRM, then they are asking you to do something that is both delusional and dangerous. It is a catastrophically bad idea to redesign computers so that they treat their owners as their enemies. Thankfully, it's also a catastrophically stupid idea. The future will not be full of theoretical computers that are Turing complete except for that one program we wish people wouldn't run. I didn't come here today to make you feel shitty about your job, but if thinking about how you are helping your boss be on the wrong side of history is making you feel shitty, then I invite you to do something about it. So we have this idea uh, in, in behavioral economics called the Ulysses Pact. Ulysses was an early hacker. Uh, he knew that the standard protocol for sailing through the sea of the sirens was to fill your ears with wax so that the siren song couldn't tempt you to drown yourself in the sea but he wanted to hear the siren song. And so he asked his sailors to lash him to the mast so that when he sailed through the sea, he, couldn't, he could hear the song but couldn't act on it. He took an action when he was strong to prevent himself from compromising when he was weak. This is a time-honored principle in, in, in behavioral economics. If you've ever thrown away the Oreos the day you started a diet, you were engaging in a Ulysses Pact. And I'd like to propose a, a Ulysses Pact for you in two parts. The first one is that devices should obey their owners. Even though there are lots of times in which the world would be a better place if devices didn't obey their owners, designing devices so that they, they uh, occasionally allow remote parties to override their owners it has much worse consequences than anything we do uh, when we can override those users at the console. And the second one is that it should always be legal to disclose defects in systems that people rely on. Telling the truth should always be legal. And I, I ask you to pledge uh, never to contribute to products or designs or activities that undermine these principles, to be hardliners for it. The, the way you can tell that you're, that you're trying hard enough is that they're calling you an unrealistic fanatic about this. Now, we are not going to win this fight. This is not the kind of fight you win. This is the kind of fight you fight forever. Because so long as computers are important to people, someone will always want to use computers to take away our rights, not to help us exercise them. The principle of computers as tools to enable and improve the lives of people who use them will always need defenders. As Aaron Swartz said shortly before his death, it is no longer okay for politicians not to understand how technology works. 
You who knows how the internet works, you have a duty to find ways to make it, to not just to make it easier for the people you love to use computers, but to understand those computers. Your foreseeable future will be filled with people pressuring you to make bad metaphors real, to break your crypto, to DRM your tools, to de-neutralize the net, and you can fight them. With the help of everyone, you can fight them because we all depend on the internet. It is the nervous system of the 21st century. We are in a race between the point of peak indifference when the number of people who fight on this uh, only grows and grows and the point of no return when it's too late to do anything about it. And you can help pick the winner. Organizations, whoops, where's my last slide? It's gone. Ah. All right, well, there's just one last slide there. It was those two principles again. Organizations like Creative Commons and Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Free Software Foundation, Electronic Frontiers Alliance, a network of campus organizations, we need your support, but not just in the form of memberships and donations, although we need those too. We need your support to help us win this race between peak indifference and the point of no return to build a future in which, people are pro uh, which computers are programmed by people, not in which people are programmed by computers. And together, we can realize that dream. Thank you. Inspiring. Thank you. Any questions? We have time for a couple questions. And if we could alternate between people identify as women or non and non-binary and people identify as men and non-binary, that would be great. So if there are any questions Anyone? from people who identify as a woman or non-binary first. Yeah, go ahead. Hold on, hold on. I can repeat the question if that's easy. What would be, uh, so if someone wanted to start getting involved with EFF, what would be like the best, if someone wanted to start getting involved with EFF, what would be the best way, especially considering you're sitting in a group full of application security people? Yeah, well, we have a bunch of different ways of contributing. W w you know, you may have seen some of our software tools, HTTPS Anywhere and, and um, uh, CertBot and Let's Encrypt, uh, Privacy Badger. Those tools have uh, a bunch of pull requests or, or a bunch of open bugs, rather, on GitHub, right? B send us some pull requests. We, if, that's, if that's your thing, do that. Um, you can also, uh, if you're involved in any kind of campus organization, Electronic Frontiers uh, Alliance is this network of campus organizations. We started last year. It's become huge in, in just a year. And so you can get involved with your campus organizations to start those. Um, joining our mailing lists actually is a useful thing. Uh, we use those mailing lists in a super tactical way. If you give us geodata, if you give us your zip code, we will tell you when your lawmaker needs a push. And we will and getting calls and emails from constituents who are registered voters in your district, especially in 2018, that matters. Even in California, where the outcomes are largely foreordained, there's a bunch of primaries coming up. It's it's there's lots of that stuff going on. And then you know if you ever find yourself in a situation where you are being asked to do something that you don't want to do if you uh, don't want to build a back door uh, and someone from a three-letter agency wants you to do it. Uh, info at EFF.org has a GPG key online. Uh, we uh, are very uh, responsive on that email address. You know, the way that we found out about NSA mass surveillance is that an AT&T technician named Mark Klein, who had been asked by his boss to build a secret room at the Folsom Street switching station for and a beam splitter so that the NSA could wiretap the whole internet without a warrant, walked into our office with a sheaf of documents, right? And that's, I mean, that's why Snowden came out because uh, um, Ron Wyden asked the, the, the um, uh, you know, the, sp the spy agency chiefs whether or not this was true. They lied about it. That was what sparked him to ask about it. They lied about it in, in front of uh, Congress. That got Snowden uh, thinking about it. That's how, you know, all this stuff came out. So, you know, really like being a whistleblower, joining our early mailing list, uh, signing up with Electronic Frontiers uh, Alliance, and, um, and getting some pull requests into GitHub. All of those things very appreciated. Does it apply to America or the world? No, it's the world. Uh, we, do, we do work all over the place. We have right now one employee. I used to be our European director. I now live here in LA. We have one employee in Berlin and one in Peru and one in Argentina right now. But we do work all over the world. And we have sister organizations we work with all over the world. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the great talk. Um, 
We have a lot of technologies, things like TPM, secure enclaves, where the sword sort of goes both directions, right? These things are used for things like secure boot, boot, uh -huh. boot or Signal recently released this great uh, zero-knowledge contact discovery using secure enclaves. Uh, so how do we have these awesome technologies that do super important things, which you were advocating for early on, while avoiding their use or abuse for things like DRM, which is what really makes the HTML5 stuff scary. So there's a uh, there's an interesting paper that my colleague Seth Schoen wrote when the first uh, Palladium systems were mooted, uh, which then became NGSTB and then became TPM. And uh, he proposed that since all of those systems had a, uh, in their spec, they had to have a secure path to the keyboard for IO, that you could have a purpose-built key to interrupt the uh, TPM's functionality and allow the user to override it. Now that does invalidate certain applications, right? If you don't trust your employees uh, and you give them secure boot devices so that they have to have a device that doesn't, uh, you know, that disables screenshotting when they're looking at certain secrets, uh, then if they can override secure boot, then it, um, it creates problems. Now, if you don't trust your employees not to do screenshots, then you shouldn't let them take the hardware home because they might have a camera there. So it, what it does is it kind of takes away uh, the, the, a lot of the applications that are really what Bruce Schneier calls the security tautology, something must be done, there I've done something. But it leaves intact a, a m many of the other models. It's, it's bad news for gamers though, right? It's, it's bad news for like using TPMs to prevent cheating. It's bad news for a bunch of other stuff. But you know, you sort of have to ask yourself, do you want uh, all of our uh, technology infrastructure to be backdoored from the get-go or you know, not able to be reconfigured by its user from the get-go? Or do you want to make sure that the guy who just smoked you in Call of Duty wasn't using an aim hack? And as between those two, you know, and I, and I don't mean to minimize it because there are also other applications in FinTech and whatever, but, but I, I, I think that it is a, it's a trade-off. And the way I make that trade-off when I think about the future and think about what the worst consequences are of not being able to have certain powers that we've never had, the power to like control how employees use equipment in the field, for example, versus not ha everyone who uses a computer in every guise not having the power to decide what configuration it has and set policy on it. I really think that it's much worse. You know, I don't want, I would much prefer that banks have to have some human error that they need to sort out than that the Iranian government has the power to make sure that everyone in Iran is secure booting into an OS that's backdoored by the government of Iran, you know? So I know that's a hard answer. You look, you look skeptical. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a tough question, but it's a good one. Thank you. Uh, we did get the wrap up sign. I don't know who to, who to listen to. It's his call. All right, are there any people who identify as human learn on binary who would like to ask the last question? No pressure. Twice. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you.